<laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to the Asheville Vedic Astrology YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Ryan's Vedic Astrology. I'm here once again with Ernst Wilhelm of Vedic-Astrology.net. Some of you know him as the Antichrist of Astrology. He is ruining things by taking the tropical zodiac and saying that it should be used for Vedic Astrology. Others of you know him as the savior of Vedic astrology, putting the tropical zodiac in its rightful place. And today we're going to talk about this. Um, he has a wonderful article and MP3 available. It's two and a half hours, three hours. Is that right? It's too long. Yeah, yeah something like that. It's, it's pretty long. Um, explaining some of the reasoning behind using uh, the tropical zodiac, but we're not going to get into that today. Today we want to hear uh, what Ernst's story is that led him to this because uh, he was a sidereal astrologer. That's correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Ernst, I'm going to turn it over to you. I just want to hear what what little worm got in your head that started making you thinking that the tropical might be something applicable and how that developed in your uh, in your work. Okay. You know, I really have to step, go back like years before that idea even entered my mind to give you the proper perspective of how I ended up using the tropical zodiac. And what I was always after when I did astrology was good techniques. I was always after good techniques. And when I started as a Western astrologer, which was all that I was exposed to, I was really excited about it. But when I started actually reading Western charts, I just felt really limited. Like I didn't have what I, I needed to get the job done. Basically, I didn't have the techniques I needed. Right. So it, it was really so bad that when I looked at a Western chart, it got to the point where I would get nausea. I just couldn't do it. And so I just quit and ran off to an ashram. Okay. But then I got into Vedic astrology there. And I was like so excited to get these old books written by these rishis. And I was just as excited to get these books by these experts, you know, Beaver, Ramon, K. N. Rao. And I was gifted this, this huge library of every Vedic astrology book that was in the English language, all the translations of all the classics. I had it all, all the modern authors at that time. I was so happy to get this, this perfect stuff, you know, and I thought, okay, this is it. These are the techniques and they've been handed down and they work. So I started working with these techniques and I would hit these roadblocks, the classics, Parshard, you know, was so difficult to make heads or tails of what to really do with that stuff. The techniques with the modern authors, some were better than others, but I, I was still always struggling for the perfect technique, the technique I could really be happy with. So I was just studying like a crazy person, trying all kinds of things all the time. But I was in a really happy place for a lot of years because I felt like I had the books that were like gospel, right? And I was doing Sidereal Zodiac, and I was happy doing Sidereal Zodiac. And um, so I got back into astrology, started a practice, started reading lots of charts, started teaching, and everything was, you know, happiest astrological days of my life because I would learn something from a book, and I do, and it works good enough. But then as I started working with more charts, I would more and more see the techniques fail. So after about three years of that, in 1998, it was like a big year of a big shift. I started to be a little more statistical about my techniques. I wanted to learn how to predict the amount of children, which is a really tough thing to do. And I gathered all the techniques I could find from about 40 classical texts plus about 20, 30 modern books. I had a whole stack of techniques. And I tried all these techniques, and they worked out. The, some of them worked out 40% of the time. The most of them worked out 20 or 30% of the time. I was like, wow, you know, you, I'd expect more of these techniques that were in the old books, like Father de Pica and, you know, and all these Jataka, Parijata, and all these old texts. So then I found that if I took the ones that worked 40% of the time and used all of them together and sort of averaged it, I was able to get a 60% accuracy. Hmm. And at the time, I thought 60%, I'm not really happy with that. Right. But later on, I discovered that Kan Rao had written that if he tests a technique, if he can get it to work 60%, he considers it a good technique. Mm -hmm. And so through testing techniques, I was finding that the truth is most techniques that people use out there work about 40% of the time statistically. Mm -hmm. The astrologer does better than that because he looks at a chart and a technique jumps into his mind, a yoga jumps into his mind that works on that chart. 
But if he did that same technique, that same thing on 10 charts, he'd only be right four to 10 times, but he doesn't. Every astrologer, every reading has a life of its own where we grab things out of the chart that are true. You know, we just, they get brighter. You know how it is when you read, like literally they start shimmering to me, you know, right. <laughs> lots of times. And, but I was really shocked at how poor these techniques were. And I was always striving for good techniques. I'm a technical person. I'm a mechanic. I like things that work technically. And so I was always just trying to find better techniques, find out how to use these techniques in these old books. And in 1998, I got to the point where I realized I had to start like testing everything um, and figuring out what to do because all the stuff done by the modern people was not testing out really high. And there was a lot of stuff in the old books that were really ignored. And so that, of course, that got me to the most mysterious of the old books, which was Jaminy. And so I started working at Jaminy and it was really painful, especially because the translations were just so terrible. And then a new translation came out at the end of 98 or early 99, something like that. And I, I was actually at the bookstore in India that, that sells all these books, the publisher. They have a huge bookstore, the Rajan publisher. And the guy just comes running to me. He goes, oh, this is the book you want. Just, just got off the press, you know. <laughs> and he has me this book on Jamie Sutures. And I read the back cover. And I'm like, oh, finally, the gospel according to Jamie. This is the right translation. I was so excited about this book. I took it home and worked with it and tried to figure it out. And again, the way the person was teaching the techniques according to their translation, we're talking not barely 40% results with it. Basically, none of the techniques were working. And I was like, great, again. So it was again this disappointment of feeling like I was being given the gospel words of astrology or something really good and not finding it. So at that point, I Which really book was started. this? Was this Abiancar's? Which book was this? Was this Abiancar's book or is this a different book? I don't want to give the name. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm not here to insult anybody gotcha. or start any other wars. Um, <laughs> but I didn't find the techniques working for me. I couldn't get them to work. And it didn't seem like the author could either because he would teach the technique in the sutras. And at the end of every chapter, he had some examples. In every example, he had to add something new that he didn't teach in the sutras to make it work. Just something that wasn't even in Jamie. He had to tweak it somehow to make it work. But I still tried making that book work, and I just couldn't. So at that point, I realized I had to really get focused, you know, and really start working hard. At that point, astrology wasn't as much fun anymore. It's fun when you get this technique, and you're reading the book. You, I know this will work. And sometimes it would work, but it would never work, like, consistently over a long, over a large, um, you know, over a lot of charts. And so... At this point, I started working really hard, and um, I learned Sanskrit so I can deal with Jamie on my own terms, because all the translations were very loose translations. In fact, most of them are just copies of a bad translation from Parashara on similar material. So I started like putting all this energy into really spending more time testing things, trying to figure out these things in this old books, and that eventually led me to... Um, the Surya Siddhanta, which I'd had for a few years, but finally I really started cracking it open and studying it. And when I, when I, and I got into the Surya Siddhanta mostly for some basic things like planetary war. There's a whole chapter on planetary war, um, how to calculate combustion. These, these basic astrological things that I wanted to read the original source about because we have, we're all taught that planetary war is calculated this way and combustion is calculated this way. And the truth is, the way that we're taught is not correct. And, you know, there's some controversies about it, so I wanted to go to the Surya Siddhanta, and I did go to the Surya Siddhanta. And, and then I also had found a copy of um, Pancha Siddhantika, which was Varaha Mihira's um, astronomical book, um, which hadn't been widely read. For a long time, it was simply not available. But, you know, it got back into print, and it's a really good book to have. So I started reading these old astronomy books to find out these basic things. But as I read them, I started discovering just how different we were doing things. So the first thing was that the really big obvious thing is that the solar months and, this, and the solar year was meant to start at the vernal equinox, which is zero Aries tropically. So I was like, wow. So what I, so what I did, and I actually discovered that like back in 90... 1998, I started doing that. 
So like in Varsha Fala, which is your solar return chart, I actually started calculating my Varsha Fala chart to when the tropical sun position was identical, but then I was still using a sidereal chart. I would see when the tropical sun would return, and then I cast a sidereal chart for that moment and do the Varsha Fala. And I had way better results. In fact, I predicted the exact two week period that, you know, the exact beginning day and end date of Bill Clinton's impeachment trial using the Varsha Fall Dashas. Mm -hmm. With, again, I calculated the chart for the, for the sidereal or tropical time, but I used a sidereal chart. So I thought, well, the, maybe, and I basically had this idea that the, um, the, Vernal equinox, you know, the tropics and the solstices determine the calendar months, which are Aries, Taurus, and Gemini, and which are the same as the tropical signs. But I still use sidereal signs for doing the astrology. Got it? And then I also found that Sri Yukteswar also said that the solar months for the calendar and the length of the year all need to be done tropically. And I started Wait. finding more and more information on that. Was that, was that in... Um uh, the Holy Science, where, where was that reference? No, no. Well, you'll read about that. There's a website called Yoga Nikitan, and he has a lot of um, digital books, um, you know, out. There's a biography by Sri Yukteswar or of Sri Yukteswar by one of his disciples. Um, so there, that biography is really good, worth reading. Um, he also has a Gita translation. He trans did a commentary on half the Gita, and there's a lot of astrology. There's some astrology stuff in there, especially the beginning. Um, so that's where I found that out. But no, he doesn't mention that in the holy science. So, um, so at that point, I wrote a Mahurta book. In 2003, I wrote my Mahurta book. And there I basically said, we have to calculate the time with tropical months, as per Surya Siddhanta, as per Varaha Mahira. But that, we, and I, in this book, I literally say, but we never would calculate a chart. Charts are calculated sidereally. And there's, you'll read that right in the first chapter of that when I talk about time. And, um, and that's what I did. Um, and then, again, I was constantly trying to find techniques. And what I want to really, the reason I'm talking about this little preview here is because the thing I want to stress is that what I've always tried to do is find better techniques. That's what I've always tried to do. I've always tried to find a way to make the techniques work more times than they did before, okay? And to really so that's, try to- that's your only motivation. That's all I've ever tried doing. Okay. You know, you know, like I said, I'm a mechanic. I want a machine that works. Right. Okay. <laughs> you know, I want a Mercedes, you know, not a Hyundai the first year they hit the U.S. market, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I like machines that work. And so I was always trying to just find better techniques. And by the time 2004 came along, I really realized that at that point, I'd really covered everything out there that was available that you could touch. And, um, and I really started getting to trying to break down some of the harder parts of like Brihat Parashar, a lot of things that aren't being used, like the mathematical calculations and the avashtas. And I started committing to trying to figure out that puzzle. But the point I want to make is I was always just trying to find techniques. And I still believe that. I don't push the tropical zodiac. I don't push the sidereal zodiac. I don't push that. I push techniques that are good. And what I found is that a technique that's good will work better on both zodiacs. A bad technique won't work good on either zodiac, and a good technique will work good on either zodiac. It'll work better than a bad technique. So what I try to do is teach good techniques. And I feel that as techniques get better, I mean, as techniques become more accurate, as we develop better techniques and don't use these really sloppy techniques that are out there. Like I said, most techniques people use are 40% accurate. And a lot of people are going to say, oh no, my technique works every time. I can't tell. I have people owe me enough money for me to go buy a new car for people who came to me and said, I have this perfect technique where you and your wife program it so I can sell lots of reports based on that technique because I want a residual income. And we'll have plenty of money to pay you for the project. I'm a dumb businessman. So I said, sure, we'll program that for you. And we programmed it and it didn't work at all. 
it worked when they used it because of their intuition, but as a technique, it didn't work. And so these people felt like, oh, they didn't have enough money to pay me. <laughs> because they're not a single one, not a single person who had a technique I did it ever work. Because that's how bad your average technique is. That's your, the average astrologer is much better because the astrologer has their intuition, their perception, their hunch to use the right technique on the chart that will work and to not use the wrong technique on the chart, okay? So, um, so with how bad the average technique is, it doesn't matter what zodiac you use. Back in 2001, 2002 time, when people used to come to me and go, oh, what Ayanamsha should I use? They'd be really stressed. Should I use Lahiri? Should I use Ramon? Should I use Shukteswar? KP Ayanamsha, what should I use? I would say, pick a number between zero and 360. And they would say 55. And I calculate their chart out with a 55 degree Ayanamsha. And I show them their chart and I pull out the dosh. And I said, didn't you say you got divorced six years ago? I said, look, the sixth Lord is in the seventh and you're running the dasha of the sixth Lord. It makes sense, right? They're like, yeah, it totally makes sense. So I said, so don't worry about it. Just, just pick an eye and, and, and start reading charts, you know, because the average technique that people use is that poor that it doesn't matter what Zodiac you use. It literally doesn't. You could pick a number between zero and 360 for every person who's a different Zodiac. And with the way people are doing astrology, do the same well. That's why you won't find going to an astrologer that uses one zodiac versus another zodiac versus another eye numb check that you're going to get a better reading. You're going to get a better reading if you go to an astrologer with better techniques. Because L techniques have some basis that's based on the zodiac. But there's always some part of a technique that's not completely based on the zodiac. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later, okay? Now, techniques that are based really strongly on the zodiac are going to do a lot better with one zodiac versus another zodiac. And the zodiac they do better with is obviously going to be not the right zodiac, but the more correct zodiac. <laughs> right? The minute we start thinking something's correct, we've set ourselves up for limitation, right? Yeah. All we know is that it's better than or worse than what I used to do. That's all we, it's all relative. We, and you know, God may show up at incarnate as somebody in some part of the world and actually say, Hey dummies, you've been doing it wrong all the time. Let me show you the right way to calculate the Zodiac. And it may be something we've never thought of. Okay. Right. <laughs> I'm open to that. If that ever happens, as long as my techniques work better on it, I'll use it. Right. So well, what's an example in your mind of, uh, zodiac based techniques because I just start thinking about just using dignity. I mean that okay. would be obviously related to Yeah. I think that like the biggest zodiac center techniques I'd say are simply Rashi dashes. Okay. Jamie's Rashi dashes, huge. Right. You know? Um that's a good thing to test zodiacs on. Okay. I think the um even the Avashtas are not that good to test the technique on because there's so much of the Avashtas based on aspects and conjunctions of other planets and only some based on the sign it's in. The problem with doing with dignity is yes, the dignity will change based on the zodiac. But what a planet gives is not only dependent on the dignity. It's dependent on the other planets that influence it. So you can have a planet in an enemy sign that's aspected by all of its friends and it's going to do way better than a planet in own sign who's not aspected by a friend and it'll even do better than an exalted planet that's aspected by all of its enemies. But that's part of the complicated aspect of it because those planets that are aspecting the planet in question, well, part of how they're going to affect this other planet is dependent on their dignity, isn't it? Not so or much. With the Avashtas, their natural friendship. Yeah. And so with the, um, while the dignity of the planet will change with the Zodiac, the aspects will be the same. Right. And the dignity is one part of how good a planet's going to do. The aspects of its friends or enemies is going to dramatically alter that. Right. The yeah, average planet could, has two friends, get, two enemies. If you get a friend aspecting, if you get, an, let's say, a friend aspecting another planet, and that friend is in better dignity, won't that help the planet do more for the planet in question? Yeah. If that planet's stronger and one part of that strength is dignity, right. yes. 
But then we're at that point, we're measuring things. But the fact is, it's still aspected by a friend and that will be felt to some degree. Okay. So when we try to decide what Zodiac's right, just with dignity, it won't ever work because all the aspects are coming into play too. Mm -hmm. So the average planet has two friends and two enemies and one dignity. Right. Now so that means the dignity is only one fifth of the picture. Okay, so you'll see people do this all the time. They'll say, oh, I know my planet has to be exalted. I, it just works so good for me. It's like, well, it's aspected by every friend. It doesn't have to be exalted with aspect for every friend. Right. So if we do things incompletely and try to test the zodiac on an incomplete principle, it won't work. And uh, dignity, even exaltation, is an incomplete principle. Mm -hmm. Exaltation is one part of many parts to make a planet do well. Well, I mean, that's part of the issue with the whole thing, isn't it? That everything is so tied together. I mean, you used yes. the idea a while back, I don't know if we talked about it on the video, but you said it's like a house of cards. You know, if you move one card, well, it's going to affect the whole house. And so yes. we can't quite necessarily zero in on one thing in particular. Um, yeah. but anyway, Rashi Dutch, as you say that that's... That's a good way to do it because right. Rashi Dashes are so Rashi centered. Right. They'll be completely different if your ascendant's different, mm -hmm. you know, and they move differently. Some of them, depending on what type of Rashi it is, movable fixed or jewels can actually move differently and have different dashes. The dasha length will change dramatically. So mm -hmm. Rashi dashes are one of the best places to check it. Another critical way to test it is with house lordships. Right. Like I do with really concrete techniques. The most concrete techniques are transit type center techniques. So like with that transit technique I showed to you, pricked an event to the day where we're taking house cusp and Vargas, which will dram dramatically change with the Zodiac or the Ayanamsha, even Ayanamsha with sidereal Zodiac will dramatically change. That becomes really heavily dependent on Rashi's. But any technique that's only, that's not strongly centered on Rashi's where a lot of other things come into play will, will never be a good way to test the Zodiac. And unfortunately, that's what most people are trying to do. They're saying, I know I have to have my, like this is one person I, I converted a long time ago. They, they said, I know I have to be like this because I know I have to have moon in Aries, you know, because I'm so fiery and, and I'm always thinking quick and that I have to be moon in Aries. Well, he said, I can't be moon in Taurus, you know. Well, when we calculate his chart with tropical, he had Mars and Aries in the 10th house. He had Ruchaka Yoga, right? Which makes you an incarnation of Mars, basically. And he had Moon and Taurus, which was really obvious with the way he dealt with his family and friends. He didn't deal with his family and friends like a Moon and Aries person from a, from a point of view, I have to do this. You guys have a good life. I care about you, but I have to do this. This guy, you know, family and responsibilities, he just thrived in it. And he made everything nice and comfortable for everyone around him, a typical moon in Taurus. But he had Mars in an angle in Aries. And so he had that strong Mars quality, but he thought it had to come from the moon in Aries because that's how he first saw it. And so I just told him, go find out about Ruchaka Yoga. And he said, oh yeah, I totally have that yoga. <laughs> so lots of times people convince themselves that their zodiac's right on a simple thing not seeing that it comes from another source right when we calculate with a different zodiac but again those are subjective things and as humans we can't ever use subjective things to test the zodiac because they did an experiment where they got a bunch of college kids they handed every college kid their horoscope it was more like a subjective psychological thing right and they all read it and they say wow this sounds like me and they said, okay, pass it to the person next to you. So everyone passed it to the next person and it was the same report. Because mm -hmm. it comes from like some human stuff. We're all humans. You know, we all have so much similar stuff. So we have to deal with it with really concrete things. How tall are you? The Rashi will have a basis on that. What's your build like? Things like that are more concrete. Well, well what about the fact that you're really tall and I'm not and we're both Virgos? Exactly. That's because I've got my ascendant Lord in Aries, which is a big sign. Right. And I have a size 13 foot, <laughs> a size extra large paw, and I'll stop there, okay? <laughs> but I weigh 195 pounds, even though I've got like 6% body fat, okay? Yeah. And, um, you know, because I have my ascendant Lord in Aries, which is a big sign. 
You got yours in Leo. In Leo. Okay. Well, Leo is a big sign too. Right. So you have so I, something else going on in your trim samsha then. Okay. All right. Because the so, trim samsha is really important for your build. So you have to look at your logna there, which I don't know what it is. But it, it'll have to be a smaller sign. Right. Or else you need to adjust your trim samsha a little bit. Right. That's getting way off topic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm just curious about that because that's yeah. something that people would ask. They would take that, what you just said, and said, well, here's one person who's tall and here's another person that's short. Yeah. So how can you do that? So that's where it gets a little complicated as well. Yes, definitely. And then the planets that are with your ascendant lord come into play. Right. You know, it's like I weigh 195 pounds because I have a lot of bones. But I have an exalted sun with my ascendant lord and the sun rules bones and you exalt the bones and you get lots of bones. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I have a big frame. So we can tell those things, and a lot of that is a bit based is dependent on the Rashi. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I um, I was able I used to predict the height of somebody. Mm -hmm. In fact, one time this client was trying to set me up with her cousin. She gave me her chart. She said, "Yeah, she's you know she's like this and this." I say, "No, she's not. She's five seven and a half tall." She was like trying to sell her cousin to me, you know. I said, she's five, seven and a half tall. She goes, no, she's not. She's exactly this tall. I said, nope, she's five, seven and a half tall. Go ask her. Asked her, she was five, seven and a half. I'm like, too tall for me. No, just joking. <laughs> so, this is an example of how we can actually, um, you know, predict that stuff to within half an inch. Right. You know, if we have the right birth time and stuff. And I did that with sidereal zodiac, but then I had better results when I went to tropical. Okay. Right. Um, the sign is one part of that. The other part are, are like the planets aspecting. So influences of planets is never the best technique. A technique that is the more Rashi centered it is, the better it is to use basically. Okay. okay so enough on that. But yeah. the main point I want to make is that most techniques out there aren't good enough or meaning they're incomplete. They're not complete enough to test Zodiacs on definitively. If they were, people wouldn't be arguing. Right, exactly. You know, the problem, the reason people can't decide on what, you know, can't all agree on what Zodiac's right, because people's techniques are not good enough to allow them to know that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like the people doing sidereal are smarter or dumber than the people who chose tropical. Mm -hmm. Even in the Western astrology, there's a lot of sidereal astrologers. Right. They're not smarter or dumber than the people doing the Western, using tropical Zodiac. In India, there are several groups of people who use tropical. Mm -hmm. In Greece, 2,000 years ago, when Greek and India had a lot of interchange, the Greeks were trying to figure out if they should use tropical and zodiac or sidereal. Some use tropical, some use sidereal. Mm -hmm. It's not like one group was smarter or dumber than the others. The problem is that they were all using the same techniques, and none of those techniques were good enough to definitively prove it. Right. And so people... I always get really amused when people come and they swear to God this has to be the right zodiac because they got a moon in Aries or something like that, you know. And that's what I find regularly comes out of people's mouths when they say, I know it has to be this zodiac or this Dianamsha because of this. And they don't even know enough astrology to begin trying to assume what is correct. Right. Because if you, if you know a technique that's partial or you don't know enough techniques and you can't see the wholeness of a chart, you can't, you can't guess. Someone could show up and make up a zodiac and it'll seem just as good. Then a third of the people will go over there if they test it with their bad techniques. So my goal has always been to teach better techniques. That's all I've ever been trying to do. Mm -hmm. I feel that as people learn better techniques, they will naturally figure out the better calculations. You know, and good techniques work better whatever zodiac calculation you use. So we need to focus on good techniques. And Vedic astrology is about techniques. Vedic astrology is not about the zodiac. Right. You know, never did it say in a Vedic astrology book, Vedic astrology requires the zodiac. It says Aries is like this, Taurus is like this, Gemini is like this, here's a bunch of techniques, go use them. Mm -hmm. That's Vedic astrology or techniques that have been preserved in India. Some of those techniques originated in India, some of them didn't. You know, we don't know where they originated. They're too old to know where they originated. All we know is that they were preserved in India and they're the best techniques on earth. But they're, they're being used incompletely 
and sloppily, and they need to be developed into higher techniques. Well, Meaning they so, need to be put back together. So in my mind, I have a sense that it should be provable at some point in time, which Zodiac is maybe the more correct. But you know, based on all the things we've said, and the more I've thought about, and even talking to you, the more I think that's really far away in the distance, because it seems like there's so many moving parts that even if you do develop better techniques, there might be something else in the background that we're not quite aware of that influences this. So my question is, when it comes to the idea of research and testing these things, um, is there a methodology, a way to do it now to give some sort of insight into uh, a proper direction? Yeah, well, there was, yeah, there's a couple of problems. All we can do is the best with the techniques that we have. Mm -hmm. And we also have to remember that, you know, astrology is such a, a, is such a perfect science but we don't have the capacity to practice it perfectly for the simple reason that our clocks will not calculate the time accurately enough. The truth is the shifts that can happen in the birth of the consciousness that's born into a body that's half a second apart is huge. You know, we don't, when you, when they talk about time in the old books, they have time broken down to fractions of seconds. And time is the force that brings an event to pass. Mm -hmm. So if people are born in a different fraction of second, something has shifted. It's a different entity. It's a different organism with a different life. We can't even calculate time to that level of accuracy. Mm -hmm. And we can't. So there's always going to be a big question mark about everyone's horoscope. There's always going to be something we're not even seeing. We don't even know how to begin to look for Mm -hmm. And they don't even have those techniques in the old books because they couldn't record that down either. But they tell us, they let us know that this is how incremental time is and that time is, brings events to pass. And so you only are going to do so good. Right. Don't expect well, perfection with any of your techniques or calculations. I don't want to take this too far out of uh, the area that we're focusing on, but when we think about things in that way that you can break things down so uh, incrementally, and if we could understand it perfectly and astrology being a perfect science, then in a sense though, isn't that simply saying that we're just in a big old machine and what's the point in kind of getting involved in it anyway? I mean, I know, do you see what I'm saying? What makes the difference between, um, okay, if we just understood it perfectly, then everything would be lined out versus how did it get that way in the first place? I mean, there has to be some point in time that is not mechanical, that is beyond the, do you understand what I'm trying to say here? I think so. But so you're saying, what's the point of doing anything? No, no, no. Um, no. It's more so if, if, if the problem is that number one, we don't understand it all. And number two, that things can be broken down so incrementally that if we just had the precise time and we understood it all, therefore astrology being a perfect science, we could predict pretty much anything and everything. Yeah. But if that's the case, then that means that this is all just a machine and mm -hmm. it's all just had someone push the button at one point in time and everything's flowing forward. Okay. But the question is then, um, there has to be some room for adjustment because otherwise, why would we even have the interest in pretending that things can be changed or different or can be directed in a different way or understood differently? So it's not a machine. I'm getting, I don't think it's a machine. Because it's only by whether we think it's a machine or not, the goal of the machine is to change our consciousness. Yes. And the only way our consciousness changes is if we believe that what we do matters. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just a whole nother debate. Okay. All right. Well, okay. we'll drop that for now. We'll get philosophical. Yeah. We, can, we can confuse people with that another day. We'll, we'll give it probably in about five to six weeks. We'll have a video for you on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So getting back to this, so good techniques is the answer. Yes. And I get upset, like with this, with this battle that's been going on with people, you know, you know, shooting little missiles at each other, pop bottle rockets and stuff at each other over the Zodiacs. This has been a very depressing thing for me to watch because I just want these people to start using better techniques. Mm -hmm. But they you think know? they are using fantastic techniques on both sides, right? <laughs> so, well, they need to develop their techniques further, though. 
Okay. What I find is astrologers settle into that technique and they think they have a great technique and then they come to me and want me to program it, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. They need to work on their techniques. People need to continue learning techniques, right. not getting up on their little soap boxes and yelling at other people. You know, they need to learn better techniques. If they want to be a better astrologer and they want the astrology world to be a better place, the only way we're going to achieve that is by people developing better techniques and testing their techniques and realizing, okay, this is how good my technique is. Do I want to struggle towards a better one or not? You know? So speaking, and, of, speaking of that and testing techniques, leading up from your uh, description okay. of how you got to where you are, what, what you, you told me one time how you did this. So using Kala. What, okay, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. okay. So then what happened, getting back to the Zodiac, um, what, we, what we're here for. Yes. Um, so in 2004, I was walking through my house and, you know, I was sitting down, I got up and took a step and all of a sudden I just got this idea to use tropical signs with sidereal nakshatras. I'm like, that's interesting. We have two circles, the nakshatra circle and the zodiac circle, and they're different. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that a while. I thought, well, it makes sense for them to be different because the nakshatra stars have always had names. All cultures named those stars. The Chaldeans had names for them. The Chinese had names for them. The Indians had names for them. And then in 300 BC, the Greeks show up and say, hey, we're going to name these stars Aries. Why would the Hindus name a collection of stars Aries when they already called those stars a Shrinium and then next to it was a Barani star? Why would they say, well, we're going to take these stars and turn them into Aries? Right. Why would they do that? You know what I mean? That doesn't make I sense do. to me to right. take little constellations. I've been there since humans can remember these little constellations, these little nakshatra constellations that had names, that had a star attached to them, that was in their proximity, and then said, well, we're going to also name these same stars, two parts of this star and a, part, and a, you know, and a portion of this star, and we're going to name them as a combination called Aries. Mm -hmm. That's stupid. Mm -hmm. Okay, in my book, that doesn't make sense to me in any way. So I said, okay, that makes sense. We got two frames of reference a zodiac frame and a sidereal frame of stars called the nakshatras. So then I sat down and I, I started playing with it and I calculated some charts that way. And I, before I could even look into it, I got scared. I said, screw that. I got other things to do. <laughs> and then I went back to working on whatever project I was working on and just kind of ran away in, in fear, you know? Why were you afraid? Because the last thing I wanted was the tropical zodiac to work. Come on, I'm a Vedic astrologer, right? Right. <laughs> I understand. And that's like the and the thing, funny thing is with me, I have this rule that if I'm scared of something, I do it. And I've done that my whole life. If I'm scared, I do it, okay? Well, I didn't do it that time. <laughs> I turned tail and ran, you know? But then 11 months later, towards the end of 2004, it just started haunting me, this idea. It just kept coming back into my mind, started haunting me and haunting me and haunting me. And I just couldn't shut up anymore. So I had to sit down. Finally, I sat down and, and started doing it because this idea, like I said, was literally haunting me. You know, I try to run, you know. And um, I started testing things out and testing things and trying to different. I, I try a technique on a bunch of charts. and said, wow, it looked, worked better. And I started playing with it. And then I started talking to some of my friends about it. Um, so I found out how to end friendship with sidereal astrologers real quick. Then I didn't have any friends to talk to anymore. So I kept researching it. And I kept testing it. I spent like two years testing it before I finally came out, you know, mm -hmm. and told people this is what I'm doing. Some interesting things that happened at that time is not only did I lose, you know, my closest um, Vedic astrology friends, um, and really since I started mentioning the tropical zodiac, haven't communicated with me since then about anything, you know, um, they just wrote me off as crazy, which you know, is, I think is a good character trait in this yuga. So anyway, <laughs> so anyway um, I was testing the techniques and one person, a very prominent person in the Vedic astrology world who I'd been in communication with, who'd always been there to help me with things I was working on. Um, 
when I told him I was doing that, he really tried to argue against it. He was like really dead set against it. Uh, but he kept talking to me at least, but always like, no, no, no. And finally, I just said, look, every test I've done after two years has worked, you know? You know, his last argument was, you know, in the last few years, you've written more books than anyone else, and you're the up-and-coming Vedic astrologer in the world. You know, you've got your books are great. They're all fantastic. And you're going to ruin all of that. You realize that, don't you? You're going to ruin your career as a Vedic astrologer, as an astrologer, if you tell people you're using tropical zodiac. That was like his, his final argument. I was like, yeah, dude, that's, I understand that's probably going to happen, <laughs> but <laughs> I can't do it with sidereal signs anymore. Because every technique I tested worked out to a higher percentage of accuracy with the tropical zodiac. And I, I didn't expect that. I was shocked. I would have been happy had it tested out the other way. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I did one final experiment. And what I did is we created a website, IS Joytish, for Institute of Scientific Joytish, which I don't even have that up anymore. We just created it as a short-term site. Although I still own the domain and everything, I might put it up again. And I created a test where I asked some very basic questions. For instance, a Saturn-Mars conjunction is, is, a, is a destructive conjunction. And usually the sign it falls in, the person will, not every time, but at some point in their life, usually damage that part of their body. So if it's in Taurus, they'll damage their face. If it's in Gemini, they'll damage their arms and so on, okay? At some point in their life. Now, if you consider that the average person lives, you know, the average person is, say, in the middle of their life, only about half the people have probably damaged that by the time they took the test. Mm -hmm. It was a very simple zodiacal thing. Then I asked a few other very simple, just really zodiac-based things. And we programmed this little questionnaire, all done by computer, where a person would say, uh, would basically pick something like it would say have you heard this body part this body part or this body part or this body part depending on the different calculation options and we did like five or six like simple these tests and we just, um, had the different options um, tropical zodiac sidereal zodiac with lahiri um, a random zodiac where we picked a number between zero and 360 and then tropical zodiac plus 30 degrees. So four. Four of them. Okay, yeah. And so we would calculate their chart on all four of these, see which of these things were present, and then offer them answers to their questions based on that, okay? Mm -hmm. And then they would click in or none apply. Sometimes none applied to them. And they would click it in. So then we got the results. We had about um, just short of 600 people take the test. Because that's how much people I was able to get to come, right. um, to get online. Because that was before YouTube, Facebook. Now I think if I ran those tests, I could probably get several thousand people. Right. So what was interesting is Tropical Zodiac tested out best. The second best was Tropical Zodiac plus 30 degrees. <laughs> okay. Well, the reason I could, <laughs> let's see, here's an interesting thing. With astrology, there's certain things happening. Yeah. One thing that's happening is that we have a planet in a sign. And those signs are spatial boundaries. Every 30 degrees, there's a shift. Planets in the same sign are conjunct. Outside that boundary, they're not conjunct, right? So tropical worked out best. Tropical plus 30 worked out second best because at least it, it shares the same boundary space as tropical. Oh, right. I when see. we add 30 degrees, the boundaries are still in the same place. The same, yes. Gotcha. When we use, um, so in any boundary center technique, like a technique that considers a conjunction, if you have the boundaries between the planets relatively correct, it'll be better. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think that one checked out second best. Then, then we had a tie for third place. Sidereal Zodiac with Lahira and Amsha tied with random Zodiac. Pick mm -hmm. a number between 0 and 360. Interesting. So what that test showed was that if you want to use Sidereal Zodiac for Rashi's, it doesn't matter what I and Amsha you use. Just pick a number, pick any random number, and it'll work just as good. But it'll be better to use Tropical Zodiac plus 30 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be better just simply to use Tropical Zodiac. Right. 
And that test can be expanded upon. Um, 600 people is not a lot of people. Um, thousands would be more ideal. Um, but that's what that test showed. And that test was like a no nice confirmation for me because I had done all my own tests, but having a, a computerized test, even though a simple one that confirmed my results was like very encouraging to me. Not give me the last bit of courage I needed to say, hey guys, <laughs> right. I'm gonna do the tropical zodiac from now on. Mm -hmm. And so then I um, wrote an article where I kind of explained all the um, things in the old books that basically showed that the old guys that we have, the, when most of these books were in between zero and 600 AD that talk about zodiacs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And all these books show, they don't show that they use tropical and they don't show that they use sidereal. They show that Hindus during that time lost the knowledge of procession. And they themselves did not know if they used tropical or sidereal. Mm -hmm. Yet people will take half those ideas from these books and use it to prove the tropical or use it to prove the sidereal. Mm -hmm. If anyone tells you these books prove it this way, either tropically or sidereally, they're lying. The books only show that they themselves did not know what they were using because they had lost the knowledge of procession. So that's why I started to test it. I said, okay, I'll try both. And sadly, tropical um, won. Mm -hmm. And so I had to so, go and paint myself black and go ba ba, you know, right. get a black sheet. <laughs> and teach the tropical zodiac. But again, I've never focused on teaching the tropical zodiac. On my websites, I don't say, come and learn the astrology with the right zodiac. I don't say that. Mm -hmm. I say, come learn you know, the best of Parashar and the best of Jaimini, because mm -hmm. I'm all about better techniques. Mm -hmm. The techniques that I found, they all work better. Every single one of them work better with tropical zodiac. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna be able to do the best techniques with sidereal zodiac, so I don't. Right. So let's talk about recreating this test. Uh, it seems like a good idea now that there is a lot more um, visibility to do it. Is it yeah, it might be fun to recreate this test. Um, my wife, who's, you know, the brains behind the operation and everything, she's in India and I will talk to her. I've been meaning to talk to her about um, throwing those back up online. I think she still has all those software tools. She's in uh, India now? What? She's in India now? She's in India right now, as we speak, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh so you're all by yourself. All alone, yeah, with my three kids, which is like <laughs> plenty of baggage. Anyway. <laughs> so, so um, you know, I have to see if she still has those. Yeah. And if she has the time to put them up. Um, I didn't ask her before she went to India, of course, because she was, had a lot of stuff to do. Um, but as far as I know, we still have all those. We ran two tests. So we, but the test tested more than one thing. I think it was a total of five simple Rashi based things. Um, and that might be a fun like test to run again. And then after that, there's a possibility of creating more tests. The thing is they need to be done by a computer because people, you know, the human, you know, the perception and everything comes into too much in the charts and it's too easy to not do everything the same. You have to do everything you have to handle every chart exactly the same mm -hmm. to test it, to test the technique. You can't do a technique and do it a little differently on every chart to right. make it work. Mm -hmm. That's what we do as we do readings. Well, the we trick is, what? you also need people who are participating to also be computers. <laughs> because otherwise, you know, now with the, 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 the difficulty and the whole debate thing that went on, you're probably going to get people sort of messing with the the responses a little bit. So you got to weed that out as well. The thing is they won't know how to mess with them because none oh, of the right, responses, they were... there's no astrology in the responses. Okay. So it doesn't say you have moon and Aries, therefore you're like this. It doesn't say that. Right. It says you're like this, you're like this, you're like this. You broke so, this, you broke this, you all broke this. Which one did you break? So they don't they know like what their test, they don't know which Zodiac they're, they're responding. They don't know what Zodiac the answers are based on. Nope. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that's great then. Yeah, so it's a very blind test. They just have to answer it honestly. Right. And then we get the results. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, the thing is, here's the thing with, you know, I'm going to talk about this test to complete it, is that the difference in success between the tropical and sidereal zodiac was not that much better on tropical on this test. Okay. Because, again, these are just very simple tests trying to take one zodiac-centered thing. You know, it wasn't trying to read the entire chart because then I would have to program an entire chart reading module. Right. You know, and that's, we're talking 20 years of work. 
-hmm. So it was a very simple one thing better thing. So the percentage that the tropical was better than the sidereal was not twice as good percentage or anything like that. It was like 10% better. It was just a little better, but it was on simple things. Mm -hmm. Now, when I did the techniques, when I tried techniques, I tried complete techniques with tropical and sidereal, and my percentage of increase was better, much better than that. But these tests were just very simple, just trying to take one thing that was zodiacs dependent and say, okay, does this one thing test out better or not? The problem with one thing, there's always lots of other things coming into play. So we're, we're like, say a person's got, um, you know, Saturn, Mars in Gemini. And so I asked, did you ever damage your arms or hands? But then let's say that person also has, you know, Saturn or so, say they have, um, you know, Moon, Rahu and the sixth Lord in the eighth house. And it's in, say, Leo. Instead, maybe they hurt something around their waist, you know, they're, they're at the you know, up here below their chest in the Leo area. So they'll maybe hurt that and not the other one because there's something stronger there. So again, we're not saying we're not looking at the whole chart we're just isolated things when you do it just isolated things because there's always so much else going on you're not going to get um a high degree of difference between one technique to the other over all the charts the truth will sort of bubble to the top and with a with somewhat of a percentage increase but only if we could program an entire chart either and then read the entire chart tropically or sidereally could we show one to be you know, 20, 30, 40% better than the other one, you know, and that's really beyond our astrological knowledge at this time to program something like that. Although I've been tempted to, to start working on that because I feel like the techniques I'm using are maybe ready for that finally. But like I said, um, we have a long ways to go, I think, before we could really create an AI unit that could really read a chart successfully. But we can pull out some useful things from a chart but to do a holistic chart reading that takes into everything into account with the computer is a task, a monumental task, because it's the computer's going to do the technique on every chart. Well, as a human, even with our fractured imperfect techniques, we look at the chart and we only handle some of it. We only apply some of what we know. And if we're lucky, if our intuition's working, we apply what works on that chart and do a good job for the person. Mm -hmm. So um, from your perspective, earlier you were talking about you were using a technique to determine, was it the number of children? Was that right? Yeah. And you said that if you use all of the techniques and you averaged it out, then you had about 60% accuracy, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so when I do astrology, I rely a lot on confluence, which means I yeah. go through everything. And then by the time I get done with the chart, after I've looked at just about everything, I see what's pointing in one direction more often. Mm -hmm. So is that, um, is con does confluence play a factor in there? Or from your perspective, do you think that there is just one technique that would be for this thing and one technique for that thing? Do you understand the question? Yeah, I think that um, on some level, there's definitely a technique for certain things that's going to work better. Mm -hmm. I think that's really mostly what we have in Jaminy. Mm -hmm. where he has, you know, quite different techniques to handle different things. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to a system of reading, you know, like say we want to use Parashar's system of, of dashes with, um, with avashtas and strengths, mathematical strengths that he has in that book, then that's like a technique that approaches everything. Okay. okay? Um, but I think that tech, a specific technique that approaches one thing can handle things better. Mm -hmm. um, but even that, even, you know, Parshar is trying to do something very different than Jaimini is, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I definitely think there is certain techniques that do a better job with certain things. I definitely think there is a technique for every job. Well, what about the idea? Um, we had talked about this, uh, I think last time I chatted with you on the phone, you, you had talked about how the, um, the ascendant Lord and the ascendant make a big difference in how the chart yeah. actually expresses itself. And I found that to be true as well. So if you get certain planets in the 10th house that are negative or positive, well, depending on how the Ascendant Lord and the Ascendant set up, we'll show you how you're going to deal with that thing. So yeah. are, these, 
is this just a, a more of a master type of technique or are these two separate things? Yeah, it's like a master type technique. It's a technique of examining the whole chart. Mm -hmm. And in the Mahurta books, they make it really clear. The most important thing is the Lagna mm -hmm. and the well-being of the Lagna and the Lagna Lord. They don't care about the house. They don't, if you're having a Mahurta for children, they don't tell you make sure the good fifth house is good. Right. They always say, make sure the Lagna is good. Make sure the Lagna is good. And I see that all the time where I'll see people have really what looks like quite powerful charts. But their lognas and logna lords are, or one of them's in a really bad logicati of Ashta, mm -hmm. and they actually live quite depressed lives. Mm -hmm. So, um, and your those yogas are not like rocking on rocking in their lives. So that there's definitely a lot to be said for the logna. It's a critical thing. So that's just a basic astrological principle, though, that right. people need to be very aware of, or else it's they'll misjudge a chart. And that's from, um, I mean, I'm sure it's in many other books, but isn't that a, a Jaimini principle, the master of bondage and liberation, or is that specific to the Atmakarika? Well, that's the Atmakarika, yeah. Okay. But yeah. Would it, isn't it a similar kind of theme? Same idea uh, that the, uh, the, the, what the Atmakarika is doing and what the, what the chart is showing from the, you know, from the Swamsha, from the Atmakarika mm -hmm. point, that's a very much a foundation of a chart. And you don't want to predict above and beyond that foundation. Right. You know, so, mm -hmm. you know, yes, getting that Jamie foundation about what a person really is, is that is we, right. we really need to start there in lots of ways. If a person right. is a person of power, then yes, those raw yogas are going to give them power. Right. But if a person is not a person of power and according with Jamie, then no, those raw yogas are not going to give them power. You know? And the raj yogas you're talking about, are you talking about the parasha raj yogas? Or any raj yogas. Just okay. any raj yogas. Yeah. yeah so. Okay. If it's not in the foundation of Jamie, because Jamie sutras are all about who the person is and what they're here for and what they're going to do. It's, it's who they are in this world. Um, and whereas all the other yogas we have in astrology are more about what we're going to have or not have in, in a, but not as, as not as much as a fundamental thing to see who a person really is, what they're really going to have, how long they're going to really live for that. We need to deal with Jamie, just those real concrete realities we have to focus on Jaimini. It's a very concrete system of astrology. Um, well, so, but then there's so the whole, go ahead. What's that? No, go ahead. I'll remember. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so that's really all. So Jaimini has great techniques for predicting concrete things, for getting the known facts. It's, it can be a bit of a scary system though, because it is so concrete, you know? Right. And, um, and of course, Parashara takes the whole person more into account. The, um, beyond the predictive ability of Parashar system, the psychological insights of the Parashar system, the psychological and spiritual insights in the Parashar system are really profound. It's, there's, you know, Western astrologers like to think that they can do some psychology with their charts, and really what they're doing is child's play compared to what Parashara will unlock about a person's psyche. And it's a real shame that Western astrologers are so against Vedic astrology. I mean, they don't want to even hear the word. They just think it's this weird stuff with most of them. It's really sad because the things they're trying to do, they're doing poorly because they're not using Parashara techniques. Mm -hmm. And we can use Parashara techniques to make predictions, but we can also use them to look inside a person in ways that probably Western astrologers are scared to look inside themselves, so they're staying away. <laughs> right, right. Because, you know... Well you get some really intense insights about yourself with Parashar techniques. You know, I did a chat with Chris Brennan um, uh, mm -hmm. a few months ago and the Hellenistic astrology and Hellenistic approach and kind of seeing some overlap between that and Vedic astrology. So who knows, maybe we'll start to make some more inroads. Um, yeah, ultimately how I look at it, if we're using signs called Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, we're doing something called zodiacal astrology as compared to Chinese astrology, which focuses on the elements and time, as compared to Mayan astrology, which uses these funny little Mayan figures and has 13 of them, you know? Right. You know, uh, you know so if we're using the Zodiac, we're all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. You know, whether we want to call ourselves a Western astrologer, a Greek astrologer, a Vedic astrologer, a tropical Vedic astrologer, or whatever, we're in the same boat. We're all doing Zodiacal astrology. So all of our techniques are complementary it's really about developing the technique to the highest level of success we can. And most importantly, learning the conditions under what a technique is for. 
-hmm. We have to understand, like Ashtaka Varga is a really good example of a technique that looks so good on paper, but gets it misused a lot and doesn't get the results people expect a lot because of the fact they're not using it for what it's really, really for. They're not using it in the context of what it really does. So people need to understand what their techniques are really doing. And then they can use them better and use them at the right time. And then we need to continue to complete the techniques, looking at the dignity of a planet and saying, oh, your planet's in a great friend sign. Good. It's exalted. Good. That's a small part of a much larger technique that has to do with a lot of other things. And to only use that fraction of it, no one will use it correctly. It, it, it won't work. It's like, it's like trying to walk with one hand. <laughs> you know, that's what most astrologers are doing. They're trying to walk with one hand and they think they have the gospel, you know, in that hand. It's not right. true. People are walking around with fragmented techniques. And if they want to make the world a better place for astrology, they need to develop those techniques into complete techniques. That's all anyone who's a teacher should be doing. Well, I think that's a wonderful idea, you know, and I've read some other articles on folks who are doing research and whatnot or doing their best at it. And the reason I keep going back to dignity is because, like you said, it's a fraction of a technique. But it seems to me like we need to figure out some of these fractions before we can start putting them together into specific equations, you know. Yeah. So I think the idea of, the idea of testing um, uh, what you were mentioning about body parts and whatnot, mm -hmm. but also you talked about Jaimini and um, uh, uh, how long a person's going to live, something of that nature. So couldn't it be done that you, you sculpt these particular techniques or you reveal them or talk about them or share them, and then we just simply go back and look at the charts of people who've already passed to see exactly. how close does it come? You know, it seems like that would be a pretty uh, objective way of doing it. You know, there's no, you can't argue that. No, you can't argue with that. And that's what I did for two years. Okay. You know, I spent, I literally spent two years um, testing every technique, I, every technique I knew up to that point. Um, you know, I, Jamie, I did most of my Jamie research between 2000, let's see, 99 and like 2004 mm -hmm. and um, and really I haven't changed many things with that I've done with Jamie since then I, you know that was really when I was focusing day and night on Jamie mm -hmm. tested all that stuff I tested everything I knew I tested Varsha Falls transits so I, I mean I did that myself um, and that's why after two years of doing that I didn't just look at a few charts and say oh this person has to have their moon in Aries or Taurus you know right it was like you know, I, I spent all my spare moments when I wasn't teaching or doing readings, I was basically testing out zodiacs mm -hmm. and um, ruthlessly. And even when I started doing Vedic astrology from day one, I was testing different Ayanamshas. You know, I learned a technique, I try it on five, six, seven different Ayanamshas and see which one it worked better on. Mm -hmm. um, and so I tested all that. And like I said, there wasn't a single technique where sidereal zodiac came out better, not once. Right. And some people like to say, well, maybe for some things we should use sidereal and for other things we should tropical. I think they both work. But, you know, I found that tropical worked better for every single thing. Well, I, I hate to be this way, and, but they can't both work. <laughs> I mean, it, at the end of the day, it, if, if this is a science, it can't be both. Yeah, it's true. Because they're not, you know, they're not two different equations, EM, you know, whatever the relativity equation is. There's not two different equations for someone over here and someone over here. So um, I think it's a great idea to, to work on this sort of thing. And I, I do think like what you said, that the intuition plays a large role in it. Um, yeah. And we might not have the capacity and the understanding right now to actually put it together in such a way that it's 100% conclusive. But still, if we're going to treat it like a science, it has to be one or the other. And I think what a lot of people yeah. don't understand, which is what you were saying, is that you're interested in, in techniques working well. And I think it's important to remember that what matters is what works, not necessarily whether it's one or the other. Because like you, if I met someone down the street who said, you know, your anomaly is totally wrong, try this one, and it worked magically on every single chart I looked at, I would say enough of this tropical zodiac sure. because it, it's about how you do it. It's not about the zodiac itself. Yeah. But we should be able to figure that out. So I, I hope one day we can do that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, um, I think we are, you know, figuring it out. And the, really the question is, as we develop better techniques, are those techniques going to continue to support, 
you know, the tropical zodiac. When I right. develop a new technique or learn a new technique, I try it. I try it sidereally. I still do. Mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, I like how that worked. Let's see how it works sidereally. I still try it, you know? Right. And, and I just, like I said, I haven't had a single technique that works better on sidereal mm -hmm. um, at all. And it's, I've tr all the techniques that people use out there, I've tried them and used them all. Right. And honestly, all the techniques that people use out there, I've thrown out as not good enough for my standards, mm -hmm. you know? And I've continued to try to put Parashar together. I've dug into Jamie and I've tried to develop more full techniques, you know, that aren't fragmented, right. um, you know, by, you know, what most people are doing, I would never teach, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't teach those to people. I would consider it a disservice to teach those techniques. I've tried them. I've realized how limited those techniques are. Right. And, um, and, you know, people, just just to be clear can you give me an example of, of what you mean like what what is what is a basic technique that you would say you know that's not complete just so people who don't oh know. gosh let's see let me try to think of something um um i mean just the raja yoga com combinations without the well okay we can we can consider, consider that yogas are um used without any mathematical qualifications Mm -hmm. But also just your basic angle trying Raj yoga is taken into account without everything else in that chapter. In that chapter, Parashar tells us the benefic and malefic house lords. Mm -hmm. And the malefic house lords are the ones that can reduce the yoga. Mm -hmm. So if you've got this Raj yoga in your 10th house with your, you know, say your fourth and ninth lord or something, but in your fourth house, you've got your third lord or your sixth lord which is going to be inimical to that log now you're on an inimical planet and it's aspecting that yoga in the tenth it's going to reduce how good that yoga does mm -hmm. and that yoga is not going to produce outstanding yoga effects and it's very difficult to find yo charts where they have pure yogas mm -hmm. and you're going to find if you look at the real guru's charts like you look at yoga and chart and stuff like this you're going to consistently see things with those yogas, that, that, those dharma karma yogas, you know, ninth and angle trine house yogas, those are really important yogas. That chapter is critical in Parashara, and that's the chapter where he gives the nature of the house lords. Those are specifically for determining dharma, dharma, artha, moksha, and kama yogas. Mm -hmm. And they're not for anything else. They're not for judging if you're going to have kids. They're not for seeing if you're going to have wealth. They're, they're not for seeing if you're going to get married. They're only for the purpose of what's in that chapter. And it's a complete system of analyzing, is the person acting dharmically? Are they acting with moksha, kama, or artha? And they work perfectly if you do it that way. If you do it as a system, as I teach in the um, Parashar's formula for yoga judgment course. And you'll find in, in real gurus, all their planets are forming dharma yogas or moksha yogas. In people who are false spiritual devotees who spent the first half of their life on dope and having lots of sex and then finally start getting busy with their spiritual life and then believe blindly in something that doesn't get them anywhere, you'll find moksha yogas with no dharma yogas. <laughs> Interesting. Because Krishna said you have to follow your swa dharma, right? Right. Well, you need dharma yogas to do that. You can't do moksha, true moksha, without having followed your swa dharma. Mm -hmm. So you need to have these dar dar dharma yogas in order to have your moksha yogas be worth anything good. Right. And you look at all the successful movie stars and musicians and stuff, they've got kama yogas d developed in their chart. You know, they're living the best life on earth possible, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And so these yogas are so revealing, such a critical part. But how do people use that? Have you, you know, you know, but has anyone I just talked to that you heard of moksha yogas, artha yogas, kama yogas? It's a whole system of analyzing the chart in that chapter. Yet all people take out of that chapter is angle trine rod yogas, right. and they don't even do it properly. They'll say, well, for Gemini, Jupiter can cause a rod yoga because it rules the seventh and tenth. No, it can't. Only Venus can cause a rod yoga for Gemini. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jupiter won't cause a Raj Yoga. It can cause a Viparit Raj Yoga, which is another type of yoga. So 
And the Parashar emphasizes the Dharma combinations, Dharma yoga, what he calls Raj yoga combinations, because that's the most important thing. Because, you know, like Krishna said, being in our Dharma is the most important thing. You know, acting upon Dharmic instincts is the most important thing. And so he mentions those, but if you study it and you understand what he's talking about with these lords, you see, you see in that chapter, you've got this whole big, wide system of analyzing the foundation of a person's behaviors. Mm -hmm. Are they behaving out of Dharma, Karma, mo Moksha, or Artha? Mm -hmm. And everyone has to deal with Artha and Kama. We have to. But what the Vipri Raj Yogas are, they are combinations that allow the person to deal with those parts of their life with the least amount of energy wastage so they can spend more time on their dharma you know and you're going to right. see the greatest people on earth the people who do the most amazing things for humanity you know who do the great things they're going to have dharma yogas and vipri raj yogas <laughs> so they're not wasting their lives sitting on the beach they're actually contributing in a huge way okay you're just saying that to be nice to me, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't even remember your chart, so I don't say anything to you directly. You go judge yourself after the show. <laughs> yeah. well, so, again, this is a complete technique that people are just saying, oh, you've got four Raj Yogas. It's like, I don't care if I got four Raj Yogas. Are your Raj Yogas afflicted by evil planets, right. by the bad house lords? Do you also have moksha yogas do you also have um viprit raj yogas you know those are huge so it's it's just an amazing it's an amazing technique that when you use it you'll never look at charts the same and it really will reveal the character differences between different people right you know like in a huge way of what what, what that person is really all about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so okay. that's one example i guess yeah, I mean, I think it's a pretty. But even the idea of like a lot of people pay a lot of emphasis to dashtanas and dashtana lords, you know, oh, the planets in the dashtana, it's good or bad because of that. Again, it's an oversimplistic approach. It's one aspect. There's an aspect to a planet being in a dashtana, and if we don't want planets there in most cases, but it's one aspect, and we can't count on a certain result because simply because of a dashtana placement or something like that, you know. So it's a matter of looking at considering the entirety of it. And that means also looking at the Vargas too, before we make a final pronunciation on what's going to happen. Right. Well, one final thing about the Vargas, then we might uh, need to wrap it up here. Uh, I was recently asked a question, you know, people say that the Shastyamsha is the end all be all of a chart. And I know we've, dis we've discussed this particular Varga before, but isn't it important to also realize that the Shastyamsha, the D60, I mean, you don't have that unless you have the Rashi itself. So it's not that it's the end all be all, it's, it's, it's all relative related to what the Rashi itself is saying. Yeah, overall, and there's mathematical reasons for this, I mean, we don't really have time to get into, but overall the Rashi chart's the most important chart. Okay. You know, um, but because everything's based off of the Rashi chart. Everything's calculated off the Rashi chart, yeah. Right. And as we go through the Vargas, that Rashi chart becomes more and more individualized. Mm -hmm. Right. So at any moment, any period of time, like say we take a two-hour period of time where we have the same Rashi chart, mm -hmm. you know, God is saying, okay, this is how I'm manifesting in a big way. And then as and then through the Vargas, he's saying, this is how I'm manifesting in a more and more individualized way. Right. Okay. And as humans, we need to really be concerned with our individuality, you know, because we're talking to an individual when we do a reading, right? Right. And so the, the final breakdown of that individuality, the final bit of vision we get to see about that individual is going to be in the D60. So because it changes every two minutes. So it's specific to, um, more specific to. Yes, it's very specific. And so I look at the D60 is that it's the conclusion but that if that doesn't mean it's everything right <laughs> you know, because it's the conclusion to what mm -hmm. it's the conclusion to what was started in the rashi chart right so you will notice particularly interesting things about the d60 you'll notice that the people who are able to pull life off the most successfully 
mm-hmm. will have a strong 12th cusp in the, Duodis, in the D60. Maybe the Lord's exalted or own sign. It'll be exalted or own sign planted in there. Mm-hmm. So you'll find, because the 12th cusp is the most important cusp in the D60 chart. And of course, then the logma is always important too. Right. So as a person, it, how I look at the D60 um, is it's the results. It's what you come, it's a conclusion you arrive at, it's the end you re- arrive at. And throughout our lives, we're always arriving at a concluding state with something. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, I, I started this job 20 years ago and I'm at, a, I'm at a phase where I'm done with it. You know, what did I get out of it? What did I really get? What's the, what's the end result of me having started this job? Right. Okay. And we're okay. We're constantly going through these endings in our lives. You know, mm-hmm. we end the phase in our relationship. We end the phase with our work. We end the phase with our children, you know, with everything. We're, comp- we're always, there's always something in our life that we're at an ending phase on, mm-hmm. you know, where we say, oh, I, I've, this is the result of my life after using Tropical Zodiac for 10 years. <laughs> this is the result of my life for using Sidereal Zodiac for 10 years, you mm-hmm. know. This is the result of my life for, you know, liking to ride bicycles, for hiking, for eating pasta, whatever. You know, mm-hmm. the, we do things and it comes to some conclusion in our lives. That's the D60. Okay. And there's Jamie has a dasha that's dedicated to the D60. And that dasha is scary to use because it shows you how you're going to feel about, you know, what you have in your life when you get to these concluding times. And there's certain times that are more conclusive, like when you go into the 12th sign from any house, any mm-hmm. planet, or you're in the, you're in the 12th, um, in the dash of the 12th Lord, or the dash of the 12th Pado, or the dash of the 12th house in the D60. Mm-hmm. These are times of like, wow, conclusions, you know, like, wow, this is what my life is. And sometimes if that dash is nice, you're like, wow, my life just ended up so good right now. And other times you're running a dasha that is aspected by Rahu and Saturn and has a debilitated planet in it. And that's when you're like, oh my God, everything I thought, everything I started ended up here. <laughs> kill me there's no reason to live seriously that's how powerful the d60 and this dasha is uh-huh. and i taught that recently and I, I don't think that many people have finished that course but i think a lot more people would be emailing me freaking out because i sure freaked out <laughs> i looked at mine <laughs> that's a really scary dasha because there is this point of coming to realization of wow this is what i get for everything i did but isn't that just life or is that just my Saturn on the ascendant that sees things that way? <laughs> well, life is like that. But then there's the times where we go, wow, I can't believe how good this part worked out. Yeah. And then there's the times like, oh, I can't believe how I mucked it all up. It's right. a D60 that shows that. Hmm. But shouldn't we then just meditate and practice yoga so we don't have to worry about it? <laughs> sure. But what are we going to do when we're not meditating? We got to do something. So I figure I can watch TV or do astrology. <laughs> <laughs> seriously that's what i told a friend of mine she she was a meditator i was a meditator but she didn't she thought doing astrology was bad you know uh-huh. she would watch a few hours of tv every night and i right. just said well i think it's better than watching tv all night long <laughs> so i'm gonna keep doing it you know <laughs> so we have to do something in our spare time and mm-hmm. everyone according to their nature is going to do different things if you've got a nature of an astrologer you'll be doing astrology in your spare time Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about following your swadharma, right? Excellent. Yeah, exactly. And that can be different for everybody. I think that's what we have to. It will be different for everybody. Yep. Yeah. But what's sad, you think about it, why does Krishna say that? It's, you know, in the Gita, he just emphasizes you have to follow your swadharma. There's a whole chapter dedicated to this. Mm-hmm. And you would think it would be so easy to just do it. I'll just be myself. I'll just do what I am. That's what following your swadharma is. Yeah. Yeah, when you realize the yoga is required to actually be able to do that, you start realizing why, why Krishna was really trying to hammer this into our heads. You know, this is not something we, that most people do naturally. Only a very small pop, part of the population has all their dharma planets producing dharma raj yogas. Right. Mostly, they might have one. On, on average, a chart has two or three planets capable of causing yoga. Right. If a person has all of those forming yoga and all the bad planets forming Vipriyat yoga, 
they're really lucky that hardly happens. So most of us are struggling to some degree where we're, we find it easy to, you know, live according to our dharma and other areas where we're like just tripping over ourselves and getting confused. And so that chapter in the Gita is really critical because following our swadharma is, is really the foundation of our spiritual lives. Like I said, without those yogas, people can't have a good spiritual life no matter what moksha yogas they have in their chart. Right. Because we have to detach from our ego. You know, and the easiest way to do that is to get lost in the inspirations of our swadharma. Mm -hmm. We're not thinking about ourselves when we're doing our swadharma. We're not thinking, what am I going to get? Who's going to love me for this? You know, when we're doing our swadharma, we're just doing it. And we're, we're conscious of life and God. We're not conscious of our ego. We're not doing, I'm doing this because I need money. You know, we're just doing it because we have no choice. And there's none of these ego considerations. So the easiest way to step out of the human egocentric condition is by following their swadharma. It's the easiest way to do it. And it's the way we can spend all 24 hours a day doing it. Well, let's, let's bring that from theory to practice, though. I mean, if no one has these things that are often in their chart, then what would you say to someone? Um, if, if, if you could say to them, and they would listen, and they would actually do it, um, but they did not have these types of yogas in their chart, what do you do? I mean, how do you... All you can do is you can, again, encourage them to follow those dharmic planets. And you, Okay, so define that so we know what, you're, what you mean define by that. Define that for them. Yeah. And then we find the importance of it. Okay. And then you know, let them know that these other actions aren't going to bring them as much joy and meaning to their lives as these other actions. But by the dharmic plants, you're talking about the ones specified in prashra related to your um, ascendant. Yes. And they need to be forming. If they're forming yoga, as a person's doing it. It's just okay. they've already developed the ability to do it. So let's say they're not forming it. Yeah. Okay. So, so they're th going to have a whole level of happiness that they're going to be missing. There's a okay. whole level of existence that they're not going to be appreciating that's going to limit the, their well-being, you know, how happy they can be. So then you would, you would not be able to say to them, this is what one of your uh, Dharma yoga producing plants are. It happens to be in the sign or such. And therefore, if you paid more attention to that, you would be a little bit better off. Is, is that? Yeah, you can do that. Because okay. what happens is they'll get lost. They'll lose themselves in those other yogas. You know, okay. like there's moksha yoga is about dharma yoga. They'll lose themselves to, you know, a method of escape, drugs, mm -hmm. or following a guru in a blind way that gets them nowhere, you know. Mm -hmm. Or they'll lose themselves to just wanting their material gratification. They'll lose themselves to wanting power. They'll actually get lost to losing power. They'll lose themselves. They'll lose themselves in their desires, you know, in wanting things, fine food, women, men, fame, whatever, they'll lose themselves. They'll lose who they are without those Dharma yogas. Okay. And so that's why you'll see a lot of these movie stars, you know, who are very successful. They got these Kama yogas and these musicians, but they lose themselves mm -hmm. in the process of fulfilling these wonderful lives, you know, these envious lives that we envy. They lose themselves because they don't have the Dharma yogas to keep them, to hold them together so they don't lose who they are, you know? So it's the Kama Yogas that are responsible for people selling their souls to the devil. Well, the Kama Yogas that make people go to Hollywood and do anything to get, make a movie. All right. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, you basically without the Dharma Yogas, people get lost. Because okay. not enough of their actions are based on who they are, their own personal integrity of who they are. Instead, their actions are based on an idea of what they need, of what's, okay. what they need to have. And those ideas, what we need to have, mostly are just based on social norms. They're not having anything to do with the individual. They're right. just to do with a certain social image. Mm -hmm. So when you start seeing where every girl on TV has the same makeup job and the same hair job and the same boob job, you know, and you see this, you know, where on news shows, they all look like, oh, they all have the same makeup artists. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no people lose themselves to these bigger pictures. Um, and they usually end up in sad conditions. You know, the horror stories with these successful people are there because they don't have the Dharma yogas to, to, main, to maintain their individuality, you know, really basically in a really horrible world, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Well, that's, that seems like that seems to be another thing we need to talk about. At another yeah, time. so much. I do have like a little video on YouTube where I, um, it's, the, I think, one of the first videos to that course. In the Dharma Yogas? Preview video where I do talk about these yogas for people interested. I don't remember the exact name. Okay. But there's some video on that subject. What, what's your YouTube again? YouTube.com slash what? what I don't know. That? Just search for Ernst Wilhelm and, okay. and you'll find it. All right, Ernst Wilhelm. Yeah, I, kind of, I thought I had it. Yeah. I don't remember either. Or you can search for Ernst Wilhelm Kala, and you'll find my ch my channel. Okay. I don't remember my channel. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's your job. <laughs> your well, job. I know it's true. Let's see. I'm just going to look it up right now. Ernst oh, thank you. Helm, and we'll do. YouTube. I guess I should know, but like I said, it's not what I expect. Yeah, David Prajna. That's it. YouTube.com/slash. DavaPrajna.com or just Deva Prajna. That's the okay. Name. So Deva Prajna for those listening who want to know what that means. Deva Prajna means consulting the gods. And as astrologers, we're actually considered to be, that's what we do. That's what we do as astrologers. We're considered to be consulting the gods, which uh, means the planets. We're consulting so we're not, the planets. We're not really just supposed planet. to be name dropping all the famous people we work with. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. David uh, Prajna consulting. And Joytish, Joytish is really the science of astronomy. Mm -hmm. So when we read a chart, we're not really doing Joytish exactly. We do Joytish when we calculate a chart. Mm -hmm. We're doing, you know, we're we're doing Deva Prajna when we consult the planets on behalf of a person. Mm -hmm. So that's actually the official term of an astrologer, mm -hmm. what he's doing. So that's what I chose as my handle. And luckily, um, it doesn't seem like it's very popular knowledge. So I got it first. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Because <laughs> Joy Tishi, Joy Tisha, those were taken 20 years ago, you know, those names. Right. You know, but Deva Prajna is like um, really the, the, what we're really actually doing when we look at a chart. All right. Well, good. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about all this. Hopefully you enjoyed it. No, yeah, um, it was a lot of fun as always. Yeah, and um, maybe we'll do, I've got my mind to do some more videos. Maybe we could do uh, a video on whether the universe is mechanical or not, and you could tell us all about <laughs> that. And then the other one, I think I would like to go a little more into the, um, uh, the idea of the, the, the Dharma yogas as you see them, because I think it's a wonderful topic, and people ask all the time, well, how do you see, you know, what is the purpose we're supposed to be engaged in? And I think that might be a key for them. Yeah, and of course, you know, just to say real briefly, I don't want people to freak out, you know, our, our horoscopes are in accordance with what we need to experience to grow spiritually over the long term. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, you know, people who have Kami Yogas, those are the experiences they need. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little sad sometimes because those, those experiences, why they need, aren't what's going to give them the ultimate satisfaction in life. But they still need those experiences in order to achieve ultimate satisfaction eventually. To find out you know, it's like. the step they're on right now to get to the highest place they can be in time. You know, so those yogas have a purpose too. They they are designed to be there. There's not no mistakes in our chart. And so, um, if I sounded judgmental, I don't mean to be. Sometimes, you know, people obviously need to have these lives. These are the lives they need to grow and to to do the work that they need to do to grow and evolve. Our charts are designed for that one specific purpose to grow into a healthier being but it's you know god i say god plays the long con you know <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you know so we don't really know how what he's setting us up for you know but we know that's something beautiful more beautiful than when we started <laughs> okay <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> all right good all right well thank you ernst it was a pleasure you and, uh, take care